tool and some observations on how that goes. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit side by side code comparison and then I'll talk briefly about performance. If you do have a question in the, during the talk, um, feel free to just um, turn your mic on and shout. Um, and then also I'll try and leave some time at the end. So just a little bit about us. So I work for a company called Codeplay. I've worked there for um, just over a year now. And we're based in Edinburgh. We've got um, over 80 engineers and we work, basically we live, breathe and eat Sickle. Um, so we're heavily involved in the Kronos group, which is responsible for the Sickle standard. Um, we work with a lot of these customers and partners in the top right. This slide is slightly out of date as of about a week ago, because in, if anyone's been uh, paying close attention to the news in the Sickle world, we were actually essentially acquired by Intel just last week. Um, that's still going on, but that's pretty exciting um, because we already do quite a lot of work for them. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, we also have our own in-house uh, Sickle implementation. Um, just briefly say that while when you think CUDA, you probably think NBCC, as in that is the CUDA compiler. Um, the, it's not really a one-to-one -one mapping with Sickle. So Sickle is the standard. And then based on that standard, there are various compiler implementations. DPC++ is Intel's. And sometimes I think maybe their marketing material maybe conflicts the two, but it is important to realize DPC++ is a SQL compiler. There are others. Uh, we have our own in CodePlay Compute CPP. Uh, and there's HipSQL, which is a project by um, University of Heidelberg, I believe. Um, so there isn't just one SQL compiler. SQL is a standard, so that's worth being, bearing in mind. Um, so yeah, one API and SQL, how do they relate to each other? One API is kind of Intel's umbrella term for the whole sort of software ecosystem that they're building around SQL. So their, their compiler, DPC++, is a SQL conformant compiler, and they have a lot of libraries and tools built around that that broadly fall under the umbrella of um, one API. Um, yeah, so just I've touched on this briefly already. Why migrate from CUDA to SQL? You, you really, I mean, the answer is fairly obvious. You open yourself up to being able to use a whole load of diverse hardware, and not just GPUs from other uh, manufacturers like AMD and Intel. Um, but also more exotic hardware, FPGAs, custom silicon, CPUs, if you want. Um, so, yeah, so there's a strong motivation there, which is that you can write code which will work well on various different platforms, but using the same uh, programming model. Um, and the cycle is running, and we've got contracts at the moment to help get um to help support the three massive um supercomputers in the us frontier aurora and palmutter these intentionally all use different uh, vendor gpus um and so sickle is the obvious i mean it's, it's really great um use case for sickle right because the, what this means now is if you're developing high performance code to run on one of these machines you should be able to run it on all three and without sickle or some common abstraction layer similar to it, that wouldn't really be possible. Um, so yeah, the this talk, I'm gonna focus on a very simple simulation that I wrote as a sort of demo, um, which is just doing an N-body, sorry, galaxy simulator. So all the particles are attracted to each other and they move according to Newton's second law. Um, and what I did was I wrote this in CUDA and then I ran it through the DPCT tool um, to produce sickle output and then compiled it and ran it again. Um, so this is a, a sort of a, a demo product just to show to show off what the tool can do. Um, but I want to say this is very much um, not a marketing spiel for this tool. I'm going to talk a lot about the, the um, sort of caveats that it has at the moment. Um, but yeah, so th this, this is the, the basis of the talk is this N-body demo and running that through the DPCT tool. So yeah, it's an intentionally simple kernel. Um, it, all it does is it has a single main loop that um, computes all these forces for all possible pairs of particles. I haven't done anything clever with bounding boxes or cutoff limits for particle forces, um, which means that the, 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 the computation scales really badly with the number of particles, right? So the, if you double the number of particles, you've got four times as much computation to do. 
Uh, and then to make this pretty graphic on the right here, I'm using OpenGL. And an important detail for that is that all the OpenGL stuff has to be in a separate translation unit because uh, these sort of uh, other libraries really trip up the conversion tool. So it's quite important if you, this is something to consider, if you're gonna use this tool, it, it may well trip up over things like OpenGL. So yeah, this is our force computation, and this is the this is the main loop of the kernel. It's, it's really simple. We just for every pair of particles, we compute their uh, the distance between them and then their gravitational interaction. Um, so yeah, this is uh, freely available. Um, I might just try and can I copy this link just now? No, uh, I'll try and put this link in the the chat afterwards, uh, so you don't have to write it down. Um, I, I've made this open source and I've tried quite hard to make it very accessible. I've got a lot of scripts in there to show how I'm building it and how I'm converting it from um, CUDA to SICKLE. Um, I've also made a, a Docker image which has DPC++ for CUDA in it. So um, I'll try and remember to send you a link to that as well. Um, so you could get going with this example quite quickly if you wanted. Um, so yeah, Intel's DPC++ com compatibility tool, it, it's a command line tool and what it does is it eats uh, .cu files and spits out SQL files. Um, it only operates on single CU files, but it, they provide a useful um, utility script um, to intercept your make um, and that will generate um, a JSON database of conversion jobs for the tool to do. So you can tackle pretty large projects with this. Um, as I said, the project that we're looking at here is intentionally simple. Um, the, the getting started guide for this tool promises um, around 90% code conversion. We actually managed to get 100% code conversion. Um, I, as I keep saying, this is a relatively simple case study. So I wouldn't want to promise that you're any chance of getting 100%. Um, but what's really nice about it as well is that it will tell you where it wasn't able to convert something and also why. So you run the tool on your code. Um, there's a couple of things. I'm going to repeatedly refer to sort of muddy footprints um, throughout this talk, which is that you, when you look at the output, from the DPCT tool, you can definitely tell that it's been auto-converted. It does things that are sort of, it, it, it's not really capable of taking a sort of holistic architectural view to the conversion. So it does some things which actually sort of reflect underlying differences between the sort of dominant paradigm between in CUDA and SQL. So um, CUDA is a little more, Dateful, I guess I would say, than SQL in that if you want to run some kernels or do some memory allocation or copying, you don't need to explicitly select a device or, or choose a device. You the so the sort of the dominant paradigm there is that you probably have a CUDA card attached to your computer. Um, SQL doesn't make any of those assumptions because it's designed to tackle such a diverse range of hardware. So for example, on the computer I'm working on here, I have two possible SQL devices. I've got my CPU through the OpenCL backend and I've got an NVIDIA card in here as well. So what this means is that you, whereas CUDA is quite happy to mem copy without any specification of what the device you want to use or, or queue, which would be equivalent to a SQL stream, a CUDA stream, sort of. Um, SQL doesn't make these assumptions. And what that means is what we have here is a method of my um, simulator, um, the CUDA version on the left. And this is just the code that copies um, initial particle positions over to the device. Um, and so what the DPC tool has to do is it relies on these, uh, it produces helper headers. So you see this first command on the right-hand side is in the DPCT namespace. So this is basically tools to mimic that statefulness. So it goes and it fetches the current uh, default device and then creates a queue from that or grabs the existing queue. And then that queue has methods which allow us to do the mem copy operations and things. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing I wanted to point out here. The second is that um, whereas um, CUDA returns error codes, um, SQL throws exceptions. So if you have CUDA code where you've wrapped your calls in a macro that does error checking, for example, 
what the, it will convert that to basically a no op macro. Um, and functionally, that's fine, right? Because once you compile that down, it's not going to make any difference. But again, it's like, it's just a bit, um, it's a bit muddy. Um, you end up with these. Um, so here's what it looks like. This is my macro for, um, um, for, for the CUDA error checking. And it just scrapes out the contents of that function and, and, and leaves it a no op. I, I'm not 100% sure why DPCT isn't capable of simply removing that macro. Um, Presumably, if you had some side effects in your error checking, that it might not be able to handle those. But this is a, it's it's an annoyance more than a real problem. You maybe want to go through afterwards and, and tidy that up. I want to point out though that it does give you very verbose comments, so it's aware of what it's doing here. It's telling you it doesn't return an error code, and so you know we gutted your macro here basically. Um, so yeah, the as I said, it relies on helper headers. So there's a huge um, collection of header files, um, which DPCT will generate for you to do things that maybe it, it finds it easier to convert them in that way. So getting default queues, it has some support for software atomic implementations. Um, it gives you very verbose comments and it does strange things like leave you with no op um, functions. Um, what I'm looking at here is my um, main loop um, for particle um, Force computation here. And on the left, we've got the CUDA version, and on the right, this is the SQL version. The, the length of the code is actually not any greater. It's just put a lot of um, comments in. Um, so one thing, when I when I first saw this, I was like, oh, don't be so pedantic. What it's telling me here is that it's the the tool is not the tool is not sure that I'm gonna get, or in fact, the tool knows for sure that I'm not gonna get quite the same rounding behavior from when it's replaced. And to begin with, I was like, oh, I don't care about that. Stop, stop giving me all these verbose comments. But actually, the, the more I think about it, the more I, I do see that there's a value there in that DPCT, the tool, it has a kind of encyclopedic and very precise understanding of how CUDA functions map to SQL. And so that can be quite useful, actually. Um, it does end up, you have a lot, you end up with uh, more comments than code. And so there's some tidying up to be done. Um, but I guess this is kind of useful. There's another weird one here. Um, what I'm doing here is um, I've defined my own VET3 type up here in the top left. And then I'm, I've also defined its plus equals and its multiply operator. And then I get a, an unusual warning about multiple migration results depending on templates. But it, this is, none of this is templated, neither the types nor the methods. Um, I think it's maybe tripping up over order of operations somehow. It's a little confusing. Um, it, I, again, I think this isn't, um, it, it's more annoying than problematic. I, I don't think the fact that it's put this comment in here is necessarily a problem. Um, but I personally am not sure what it's trying to tell me here. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes you might get spurious warnings. Um, so yeah, just a little summary in terms of what the output that you can expect to get from the tool. It is very reliant on these helper headers. Um, and the warnings are, Occasionally spurious, always verbose, um, but there's some useful little nuggets of information in there that I probably wouldn't have uh, picked up on myself. So I think in a way that's quite neat. Uh, yeah, so as I said, it's a whole host of these helper functions for device info, software atomics, memory transfer stuff. Um, and when you run the tool by default, it will spit out all of these into your project directory. Um, now, the workflow I found most useful for this was to run the tool like that once, and then you can pass in an argument that says, don't bother generating these headers again. And then I just scraped out all the ones that I wasn't interested in and kept the ones that I needed. Um, I think in general, like I said earlier, the, the need for these helper headers reflects a difference in, essentially a fundamental difference in how CUDA and SQL works. And an incapability of the tool to make broad structural changes. Um, so to go back just briefly to this example here. Now, what I if I was writing this code from scratch, what I would do is I would have I would probably have the queue to be a member of my this galaxy simulator and 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 initialize that in the constructor. Um, obviously, the DPCT 
considers that to be too bold a design choice for it to feel safe making that. And I think that's understandable. I think, I mean, if you know anything about compilers, you know, and not to say that I do, but the little that I do know about compilers is that it, trying to understand the possible side effects of something like that can be um, a significant challenge. Uh, so I understand why these headers are used, but I think in a sense, I am starting to feel like wherever I see these headers, what that's telling me is you need to make a structural change that would, that would remove the need for these headers. So that's something to be aware of. Um, th this is the exciting bit. I, and like I said, the reason that earlier that I was so, I'm being very open source about this. I put the code there, I've got nothing up my sleeves. We were quite surprised to see this. The, the code, the kernel actually runs faster on Sickle than it does on CUDA. Um, and that's interesting. We previously have been boasting about getting within a few percent of native CUDA performance. Um, we don't often see superior performance and it, try to work out what's going on here. I, I have been looking at these two, um, at the two compiled products in using NVIDIA profiling tools. And just a side note here, one of the ni nice things about using um, Sickle with a CUDA backend is that you can continue to use NVIDIA profiling tools. So if you're familiar already with Insight Systems and Insight Compute or uh, NVProf as it used to be before they were split, those tools still work with Sickle if you're targeting an NVIDIA device. Um, so I, I've looked at these in Insight Systems to see if first if it was something to do with superior scheduling or memory transfer speed, that all looks pretty much identical. Um, and so then digging in a little deeper with Insight Compute, it it, it does seem like the, the, the kernel itself is faster and I am still struggling to identify exactly why that is the case. I, one theory I have is that um, CUDA might be being a little over eager in terms of trying to do loop unrolling. So the, while the SQL version has only two branch instructions in the, in the kernel, the CUDA one ends up having about nine. And I, I'm not sure if that's because it's trying to catch these edge cases that happen when you do loop unrolling. Um, but this is ongoing. Just try and work so, out what's going on here. Uh, okay. Maybe I can maybe I can help with the confusion a little bit. Great. I've been I've been looking at your code while you were talking. Mm. Uh, you, your scripts uh, with which you compile the code do not specify any mm. optimization level for any of the compilers. So, mm. so you are compiling all of the code with the default optimization settings of everything. And mm. yeah, I know that the Intel compiler. Well, and well, including uh, the uh, the CUDA enabled Intel compiler is a lot more aggressive with optimizations out of the box than any other compiler, basically. That's so interesting. I, Can you give me any examples of um, of optimizations that the Intel compiler would do that the CUDA one wouldn't? Um, well, uh, out, so out of the box, then uh, then you build. Uh, uh, Intel's LLVM code, it, mm. you build it for a, you have to select a specific uh, um, compute architecture, an, an NVIDIA compute architecture while you um, build the compiler. No, no, you have to enable CUDA support, but you, you can specify uh, an architecture when you compile code using the compiler, but whilst you, <clears throat> whilst you're building the compiler itself, I've not seen any flags relating to specific architectures. Yeah, I, I might be confusing that with uh, with some other use case, but uh, but I do know that uh, uh, the Intel compiler for CPU backend, so just host code compilation mm. happens with some amount of optimizations, even if you don't ask for any optimizations mm. from the compiler. Uh, mm. My very first reaction would have been that may hey, maybe maybe it's doing the same thing for uh, for CUDA code, but whatever the case may be, if you want to compare the performance of of two different pieces of code, you should uh, you should spend some time in in setting up uh, the the optimization flags of all of the compilers carefully so that uh, there would be an apples to apples comparison. 
just mm. out of the box settings, yeah, usually are not super meaningful. Yeah, I think um, I know that, for example, by default, DPC++ doesn't do O3 in device code, for example. Um, so I, I, that is a good point. I think my, my gut feeling is that actually CUDA is, because, as I say, it's being a bit overeager with loop unrolling, whereas we don't see any attempt to do the loop unrolling in DPC++. So my suspicion is that while that is correct, I think if anything, that would strengthen the comparison because I've not run them, I've not built this with O3 um, for the device, I don't think. I, I need to double check that. Um, but I, but yeah, no, I take your point. It, I need to look up a little bit closer at the compiler flags. But I do, I do suspect that the, the actually the default device optimization level for DPC++ isn't actually that aggressive because we have had previous customer projects where we began with um, default compilation and ended up making significant performance improvements by adding various obscure flags um, to do with hardware atomics and un loop unrolling and um, inlining more aggressively. So, so in the past, we have seen similar behavior as well uh, and comparing uh, SQL and CUDA code. But mm. uh, uh, in the end, we, we always ended up with uh, the two being very similar to each other, but, uh, but the SQL version of the code was never actually faster than the CUDA mm. version. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, like I said, that's been our experience up until recently as well. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's a bit of an open question to be honest. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, as I said, we've, we found that the SQL version is actually faster. Um, please do test this. And if you have any feedback about how to speed up the CUDA version relative to the SQL version, then I would be very grateful for that. Um, but just in case you find that you run DPCT and your code isn't as fast, this is a slightly um, random collection of uh, profiling tips that come from my experience over the past year. So this is definitely not exhaustive. Um, and the, my, the first tip is use the NVIDIA profilers. Like I said, they work well with uh, SQL for CUDA. Um, avoid using shared USM. They, this is a sh shared USM, and if you're not familiar, is equivalent to CUDA managed memory. And actually under the hood, it is CUDA managed memory if you're targeting an NVIDIA device. Um, and the, the nice thing about it is you get automatic migration of your data between host and device. So you just allocate it and you can write to it and then you read it on the device and, and you, you don't have to worry as much about moving the data around. But the mechanism through which that data is actually moved is um, operating system level page faults. And the page fault mechanism adds unbelievable overhead actually. Um, it essentially, and we had an example where it was doubling the time of the kernel just because half the kernel, it's just sitting there waiting for the data to be moved across. Um, so it, it's really useful for prototyping, but don't use shared USM um, in production code unless you're really sure about what you're doing and you're using sort of prefetch and advise and things. Um, experiment with work group size. I think this is generally a good profiling tip. I think maybe if you have CUDA code and then you're going to target the same NVIDIA hardware, um, you'll probably find the same work group is likely to um, be optimal, but it, it's worth checking. As my investigation into these two kernels shows, the, 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 although you're using the CUDA runtime API under the hood, when you sorry, the CUDA driver API under the hood when you're using SQL, the compiler is separate. Um, and so you're getting a different, um, you're getting different PTX output from the, the SQL kernel. So it might be worth checking your work group size. Um, make sure you're inlining. This applies more to projects that have a lot of uh, more a lot of complexity. In this case, my end body kernel doesn't actually call any other functions, but this is a good idea in general. Pass this flag in and it will get very aggressive inlining. Uh, make sure you're using uh, hardware atomics. Again, this smacks of personal experience. This is something that we ran into in a code in, in lamps, actually. And we it was a very um, atomic heavy kernel. And we found that actually by making sure that it was enabling the hardware atomics that we 
got a three X speed up, um, which is quite something. Um, so yeah, definitely worth if you if you convert your code and you see that it's several times slower. There's almost certainly a compiler flag that will help. Um, so yeah, just a little summary of the DPCD caveats. It, it, it doesn't quite track the latest CUDA version. So there's um, a motivation for maybe hanging back on 11.4 uh, or whichever you're on. Um, I faced this issue on our dev machine and ended up having to run the tool inside a Docker image where I had an, uh, an older version. Um, you only really get about 90% code translation. Um, one of the things I tried was putting some device random uh, library stuff in and it wasn't so happy about that. It suggested how I might change it, but it wasn't able to get it totally working. Um, it relies a lot on these helper headers, which again, I'm increasingly thinking of is an indication of required structural change. Um, it's, there's a weird thing that I don't quite understand, which is that it doesn't seem to be able to introspect the dimensionality of CUDA kernels. So you, there's a flag that you set that you either assume 1D or assume 3D kernels. And no matter what the CUDA kernels are, it will generate that dimension that you request. I have no idea why the tool can't just go in and see that a CUDA kernel has dimension one, two, three and, and make the equivalent kernel. Um, maybe that's something that will be fixed down the road. It's a bit of a weird one. Um, but having said that, um, it is great for initial rapid porting. Um, and as I said, it has this sort of very precise encyclopedic understanding of what sickle function maps to which CUDA function and what the differences or caveats might be with that translation. Um, so I think there's a real value there, actually. Um, and I think... It, yeah, the uh, as I said, it leaves muddy footprints, but there's uh, nothing to stop you going through and removing those muddy footprints after the fact. Um, so yeah, I think on the whole, it's a useful tool. It, it has limitations, but um, in terms of getting up and going with Sickle, it's pretty useful. Um, and then just finally to point out, I don't know if anyone's seen this, that recently the Intel released this open source tool called Sickle-O-Matic, which um, it, we were a little unsure how closely this maps to DPCT. Uh, so we spoke to the developers and what they said basically is that they are the same tool. The Cyclomatic because it's open source and it accepts pull requests is more likely to be sort of bleeding edge, whereas you're more likely to get stability from the product version of the tool. And you can download that there. Um, yeah, so as I said, we, we were able to get the tool to convert our whole code automatically. We got better performance. Um, and these are the caveats that I'm not going to say again because I think I've um, I've trod this ground sufficiently already. Um, yeah.